coronary artery disease, also known as um, coronary heart disease. We kind of use those terms interchangeably. Um, this is something that you learned um, in uh, Adult Health 1 or Transitions. Um, but we need to go over it again because it plays a big role in a, in a, as a risk factor for, for a couple of the um, diseases that we will talk about. So remember that coronary artery disease is uh, athero atherosclerosis, right? And what that means is, it's a hard word to say, it's, it's plaques and stenosis and, and lipids and all these things caught up inside of an artery, inside of the coronary arteries. And those arteries are extremely important because they give oxygen to the heart and the heart is the muscle that pumps oxygen around our body, right? So it's very important to those arteries. So with coronary artery disease, there's plaques, therefore it decreases the amount of blood flow that goes through the coronary arteries, therefore decreasing the amount of oxygen that is delivered to the heart muscle. Remember that there are modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors for really most diseases. Um, for coronary artery disease, here are the, mo the non-modifiable risk factors. That means those are things that a person cannot change uh, that increases their risk for coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease is largely a disease of modifiable risk factors. Some people simply have extremely bad genetics when it comes to lipids and things like that, and they just, you know, they can exercise every single day and still end up with coronary artery disease. But by and large, in America, uh, coronary artery disease is a, is a disease of, a, of modifiable risk factors. And here, here, here you go. Um, so LDL is the low-density lipoproteins, which are the bad lipids, the bad cholesterol, and low HDL, high-density lipoproteins, and those are the good cholesterols. The higher the HDLs, the lower the LDLs. Um, so, um, and XRS is exercise. I like to create abbreviations, um, but I'll let you know if I created it. So the person with coronary artery disease, um, will ha here are some uh, uh, complications of it, and I'm not going to read it to you, but, you know, coronary complications due to coronary artery disease, right? There are some, uh, there's a nice box, I think, on, um, you guys are in edition five, I think all of you now, but on page 919, there's a, there's a box to, to look at for a CAD. So we said that coronary artery disease can lead to these cardiac complications, so uh, one of these is angina. You also learned about this in a previous class. Uh, but remember that angina is cardiac chest pain. You can have chest pain that is not cardiac related. That's not angina. That's just chest pain. Maybe it's you know intercostal chest pain or something like that. But angina is cardiac chest pain, and it's caused because there's ischemia to the heart. All right. Things tend to hurt when they're hypoxic. All right. Um, there's a few types of angina, which you have learned. This is a review. So stable angina is the one that is not as severe. Uh, this is relieved if the person stops doing whatever is causing the chest pain, or if the person takes a nitro and it makes the pain go away. If it's stable, it's easily resolved. Think of it that way, easily resolved. <clears throat> Variant angina um, is not necessarily caused by um, plaques in the coronary arteries. This is the angina that is caused because of vasospasms, arteriospasms. Okay, so if the vessel spasms, it also is going to decrease the flow to it and cause ischemia distal to that spasm, right? Sometimes this happens at night. The person wakes up with chest pain. You think about the front smell as a variant angina. Um, it, it could be irritation of that area. It could be an irritation like um, um, lifestyle things like caffeine. And things like but it's, it's quite uncommon. Unstable angina is the one that is most dangerous. So this is the angina that is caused by, you know, arteriosclerosis. Um, and this pain is not relieved with intervention. So therefore, the patient sits down and rests. They're still having chest pain. Maybe it's even getting worse, even though they're sitting down. This person maybe is taking uh, lots of nitro, which you remember that nitro is a medication that causes 
vasodilation, right? Hopefully to open that artery up so we can get more blood flow through it. Still, the patient's having chest pain. So, this patient is at extremely high risk of having a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, death of the heart tissue, okay? <clears throat> risk factors for an MI are basically the same as risk factors for coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease, of course, is the number one leading thing for an MI. Generally, you don't have an MI if you don't have coronary artery disease, right? So just remember that you have the, 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 the coronary artery disease. I just put it in fancy words, right? Um, so you have the coronary artery disease. You have uh, the blood flow is impaired to the heart tissue. Eventually, that, that coronary artery disease will become so uh, severe and block the artery so much that blood flow can be either obliterated or nearly obliterated. Therefore, if oxygen is not getting to a part of the heart muscle, what's going to happen to it? It's going to die, right? Infarction means death. <clears throat> when that heart muscle dies, um, what does it lose the inability to do? Pump, Pump right. Yeah. So therefore, you're going to have what? Signs of decreased cardiac output. Right? Because the heart's not effectively pumping. Because part of the heart muscle has died. Because the heart muscle dies, any muscle that, that has any damage or even overuse will release specific enzymes. There are enzymes that are cardiac specific and there are enzymes that are not cardiac specific. So if you had, for instance, your um, CPK, creatinine phosphokinase, it is not cardiac specific. Any muscle in the body that becomes overworked or damaged is going to release CPK. If you go play tennis for three hours and you immediately get your blood drawn, your CPK will be elevated, all right? But it will naturally go down, your kidneys will clear it off, and you're all good to go. But in, when the heart muscle is damaged, there are two enzymes that we think about that are cardiac specific, and it's troponin and CKMD. I think I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Remember those classic manifestations of an MI? Chest pain, right? It often radiates. Usually when you think about these classic signs of, of, a, of a heart attack, we're talking about men, right? Women often have atypical signs of a heart attack. Maybe, you know, we think of, or we usually think about the left arm, the left neck getting numb. Women often it's the right side. Um, with women, sometimes they won't even report chest pain. So, oh, I've got indigestion really bad. Maybe they have a stomach ache. Maybe they're asymptomatic. So just realize that women are more atypical in their presentation of an MI than men are. Men are going to have those more classic symptoms. So you, here are the classic symptoms. Chest pain, obviously, is going to be the number one sign of a heart attack. And um, it, it, it's usually described as pressure, crushing, um, something like that. Very severe. And usually, you know, because this patient probably will have had preceding unstable angina, so they nitro is probably not going to help very much, rest is not going to help very much. They're going to have persistent chest pain. It's going to be very severe. Also, these, these uh, other signs and symptoms that come along with this, the patient may end up being hypoxic, so they'll be short of breath, anxious, the chest pain, even the thought of, oh my goodness, I'm having a heart attack will cause you to be anxious um, and will exacerbate the problem. Your metabolic demand goes up, you need more oxygen, so this ends up getting worse, right? So, lots of other symptoms, all right? Generally, with a heart attack, the chest pain is not affected by deep breathing, okay? So, just remember that. So, so usually when you, when you triage a patient and say, I've got chest pain, that patient is going to be number one triage, usually. It doesn't matter what it's from, you always consider it's an MI until it's ruled out. So um, they will often, uh, or you will always ask them, um, does it hurt worse when you take a deep breath and you're assessing for respiratory chest pain and pericarditis and things like that. But usually with an MI, it's not going to increase with deep breathing. Um, it's just going to hurt continuously. 
So I'll talk more about you know, the cardiac enzymes, of course, are part of the diagnosis, but another diagnos diagnostic tool is an EKG. An EKG is going to tell us about, um, um, mainly, we're looking at ST segment changes. So in the patient that has um, an MI, they may have um, ST segment changes. So when they have an MI, when there's infarction of the muscle, they have an ST segment elevation. And generally, an old MI is going to be ST segment depression. Um, but do realize that um, just because the patient uh, doesn't have EKG changes does not mean that they're not having a heart attack. There's two types of heart attacks that the ERs will say. There's a STEMI and an NSTEMI. Um, the one that is most severe is a, is a STEMI because that, that, that's, that indicates that it is probably more severe, and that stands for ST elevation MI. NSTEMI is non-ST elevation MI. In the patient that has a STEMI, the, the goal usually in these, in these chest pain centers is to get that patient from the, from the door to the cardiac cath lab in 45 minutes to an hour. Because what is happening? The heart muscle is dying. We have to try to save it. We get them to the cath lab and hopefully we can reperfuse that part, portion of the muscle that is dying. Um, these are some other things. Remember, the, the T wave may invert also on the, on, the, it's on, the, um, on the EKG. And there could be Q waves. I'm not going to ask you to identify a Q wave, but just remember that a Q wave um, is, uh, is also indicative of an MI. But real briefly, Q wave is basically the depression of the QRS uh, more than the actual height of it. So just remember, it's QRS depression. Not, not a big deal. Okay. So I told you about the cardiac enzymes that you have lots of muscle enzymes, that cardiac enzymes that are cardiac. The enzymes that are cardiac specific are the troponin and the CKMD. So just, just remember that you're going to draw in your nursing career lots of cardiac panels, constant all the time while you're drawing. Um, and, and they're going to test for several things, not just the troponin and CKMD. They're going to look at the CK or, or CPK. CK and CPK is the same thing. Uh, myoglobin as well. Myoglobin is also uh, released when there's a breakdown of the muscle. But myoglobin and CPK or CK are not cardiac specific. But they are also released when there's cardiac pain so or, or cardiac ischemia or infarction, so therefore they will monitor them. But remember that the ones that are diagnostic are troponin and CK and D. Okay? Yes, ma'am. How long the, is the main diagnostic the EKG? Because how long does it take for the troponin and CK and D? Exactly. Yeah. Take? Right. So, the, the you were, it's used, you know, conjunctive or adjunctively. I think is the correct word to say it. But used together. Um, but the the specific diagnosis is going to be the troponin and CKMD. Every patient that has an MI is going to have eventually elevated troponin and CKMD. Uh, but not all patients that have an MI are going to have ST segment elevation. But so, would they wait to treat until the troponin comes back, or else? That's one thing that you're going to have to learn, but the troponin usually starts to rise in two hours. Generally, by the time that they get to the ER, the ambulance gets there, they've had chest pain, probably as soon as, when they get there, it's probably already going to be elevated because two hours has probably already passed. The MI may have even started and the patient didn't have chest pain yet. So realize that by the time you draw it, it's probably going to be elevated. But in the patient that is in the hospital, patients that are in the hospital for something else can also have a heart attack. Not just come in with chest pain from the, from the ambulance. So those patients, you might see it on the, the second round of, of, of elevation of, or of chest pain or of the MI occurring. So that's a good point. But just realize that all patients who have an MI will have an elevated troponin CKD, but not all patients will have an elevated ST segment right? or a T wave or a T wave inversion. <clears throat> ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, indicates inflammation. Right. The white blood cell will, can also elevate during an MI, right? because the, the body detects inflammation. Um, that heart muscle is dying, the inflammatory process will kick in, and the white blood cells will in, increase because there's inflammation. Right? That's what happens. Um, it, this statement here says, know the onset, peak, and duration of the enzymes, and that means troponin and CKMD. So no, what that means is when, when they can be detected initially is the onset. The peak is when they will be measured at their highest, and the duration is how long do they stick around. 
So you need to, to learn six times here, right? Because you've got CK and the intraponent, and you've got three different things to remember. The most important one to remember, if you can only have time to remember one, is the onset. Okay? What that means is, I just talked about it for a second, but troponin and CK and B are going to elevate at a certain amount of time after, or show up, or going to appear in a certain amount of time after the cardiac damage occurs. Generally, we think about um, troponin begins to appear in two to four hours after an EMI starts, and CKMB begins to appear in four to six hours after an EMI starts. Some sources will say six to eight hours after an EMI starts. So which one will you see elevated first? All right. That's what's most important. All right. And there's a box in your book that tells you all, all those times. I don't have them all memorized because I only remember in practice the most important. But you guys have to remember everything for once, right? <laughs> but I told you what was most important. An echocardiogram actually um, is, is similar to an x-ray, but it's uh, ultrasound, I mean. So therefore, we're looking at the heart, inside of the heart, seeing how much it is pumping, looking at the valves. Um, and the, the echo can tell you tell us exactly what the cardiac output is. So it's a very good test. Um, sometimes the part of the muscle that is damaged is the part of, is is, um, is around the area of the valves. So if the valves become ischemic, they become dysfunctional. So or that the muscle around that hangs on to those fibers of the valves, if that, that's damaged, it can be, the valve can become dysfunctional, which can lead to lots of complications. All right. Is the echocardiogram is that the same as the arteriogram? No. no. An echocardiogram is an ultrasound. It's just it's either trans, it's through the chest or you know, through the esophagus and what, but it's an ultrasound of the heart. Right? That is usually not used in the acute diagnostic phase, but eventually they will take a look at the heart with an echo. Radionuclide imaging. This shows us the flow of blood through the heart. Un with un in nuclear medicine. So they, they put in a radioactive dye into the bloodstream and we look at it under um, uh, uh, line, yeah, something. I can't think of it. It's a block. Yeah. Are you okay? And, so, and you can see the flow of blood through the heart. Usually this is not done acutely in the diagnosis. It's usually often done in the prevention of it. So we'll have this done maybe before. But you can test it. Can't you also see the flow of the blood through that echocardiogram with Doppler? With Doppler? They did that on, my, on one of my PEATS patients, and he was looking at the flow of the blood. Probably what they were doing in your PEATS patient is they probably had a hole in their septum of their heart, so they were looking to just listening. A Doppler, I think about just listening with. But with an echo, they can visualize it. It's a, it's a, it's a um, ultrasound. Right, he was saying he was looking at. With the echo, he was looking at the flow of the blood. Yeah, the blood. sometimes I call it a Doppler ultrasound or something like that. So maybe they can see a small portion of it. But this is, the, but that's a more of a monitoring, ongoing thing to see if it's improving. But the echocardiogram, you can, you can visualize everything. You can get a lot of numbers from it. Okay. We talked about ST segment elevation. So this is normal, right? See that ST segment is laying on the isoelectric line. This ST segment is above the isoelectric line, ST segment elevation. And then for the depression, this ST segment is below the isoelectric line. Can you see that? When you think about the treatment of an MI, just remember the acronym MONA. Morphine, oxygen, nitro, and aspirin. Unless they're allergic to one of these, right? Sometimes patients are allergic to aspirin. We always assess that first. <laughs> Morphine is used for pain, but why is it a good choice for pain relief in an MI? It causes vasodilation. Oxygen, part of the muscle is ischemic, hypoxic, so we want to maximize the amount of oxygen that this patient is carrying, so we can maximize the amount that's being delivered by whatever amount of blood is getting there. Okay? Nitrates, you know how those work, right? Vasodilation, right? Hopefully to open up the coronary arteries to reperfuse 
that, that ischemic or infarcted area of the heart. I said assess allergies. You know, sometimes patients are allergic to these things. The patient would not be allergic to oxygen, but uh, um, <laughs> aspirin, nitro, and morphine, a person who have an, an allergy to any of those three. Let me be sure that's that. Um, another important thing to assess in your patient when you're treating them is to, to assess if they're taking PDE5 inhibitors. And these are medications like Viagra and uh, things like that, sildenafil. Um, there's really no reason to chuckle about it, but because this medication is also used in women. Okay? This medication is used in lots of patients. And the medication was uh, developed to treat pulmonary hypertension. And I just happened to notice that it had a side effect, okay? So um, this medication is used in lots of patients, but by far the, the highest use is for erectile dysfunction. But you have to make sure that this patient um, has not had this medication in the past 24 hours. Because why? Blood pressure. Why? Blood pressure. Why? What is why? Right. So Denafil works by causing vasodilation. Viagra, nitro works by causing vasodilation. So this patient would have a high risk of having very low blood pressure after giving them nitro. All right. One thing that can be done, especially if it's done soon after the beginning of an MI, is to give fibrinolytics. You you learn that heparin and things like that are, don't dissolve clots; they simply prevent them from getting larger, and the body breaks the clot down naturally. But there are medications that are called fibrinolytics that actually break clots up. So we call them clot busters. TPA and tryptokinase are the ones that I think about. Um, TPA probably is more common now. These medications increase a patient's risk for bleeding. bleeding, right? So they work by affecting the clotting cascade. So therefore, um, and, and it actually breaks down the fibrin and all of that stuff to help reperfuse that heart muscle. But realize that this patient is at high risk for bleeding after administering this medication. So that would be a priority nursing assessment. <coughs> um, and um, the fibrinolytics should not be used in a patient who has a history of a hemorrhagic CVA, which is a stroke caused by bleeding of a vessel. It's a contraindication. So that's part of your history taking. Right? Have you ever had a stroke? What kind of was? Yeah. All right, it's in the record, whatever. Okay. We can give antidysrhythmics if necessary to a patient who has an MI. You know how these drugs work, right? Calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. If you don't, it's a big problem. But you know these drugs work. Um, and then the patient will likely be placed on heparin. Um, every patient who is after NMI will be placed on an ACE inhibitor, unless they have impaired renal function. But every patient will be placed on an ACE inhibitor. The patient may need vasopressors. Vasopressors are medications that increase blood pressure. So this patient may have severe signs of decreased cardiac output, may have a severe MI, and uh, they are not able to pump enough blood out to maintain perfusion in the body. So they might need some help with vasopressors acutely. And, of course, if the patient wasn't already on antilopemics like a statin, a medication to decrease um, cholesterol, they will be on it after they have a new mom. Okay? Because most likely that contributed to their coronary artery disease. Mm -hmm. Ongoing treatment. Um, so... Uh, Part of our nursing responsibility for this patient is to make sure that they stay on continuous EKG monitoring. We keep them on bed rest acutely anyway to decrease their what? Demand for oxygen. Um, their diet will be an American Heart Association diet. Have they changed the name of that diet? So one of them changed. They changed the name of one of them. But anyway. So remember this is low fat, low cholesterol, low sodium. Um, other things that, uh, another thing that is done, especially if the patient has a stemming, is a, um, is a heart cath. So remember, we'll talk more about it, but PCR is basically the act of doing angioplasty or stenting during a heart cath. 
And what this does is they go into the coronary artery and they open it up somehow with a balloon and or a stent. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. Okay. Isn't there a slide on? <clears throat> These last two bullets are just FYI, you know, whatever. Um, I think the uh, intra-aortic balloon pump can be used in a patient who has had severe MI. If they didn't die, uh, their heart muscle is barely working and cannot produce much cardiac output at all. So what this does is it's, in, it's inserted in the femoral artery and it's threaded up into the aorta. And this um, it intermittently in sync with the EKG rhythm will inflate and deflate, increasing the patient's afterward. So therefore it increases the pressure so the patient gets hopefully more. It's a very invasive, certainly an ICU situation thing. Um, I've seen one of them. The med doesn't use them, but if you, if you work at Memphis Germantown or if you work at somewhere like that, that with their CV ICUs, you probably will see these. So, um, a ventricular assist device. I think about this as the big chain in the heart. So, uh, remember before he got his heart transplant, um, he had a ventricular assist device, and it works similar to a balloon pump, but it's in the heart and helps the heart effectively pump so that we have good cardiac output. And this wouldn't be an acute treatment, right? So this would be placed later, you know, the patient's probably on the heart transplant list and they have severe damage. All right, so those are the FYI bills, last two bullets. <coughs> You'll learn that the theme of this entire lecture is decreased cardiac output. Just about everything that we talk about is going to cause decreased cardiac output. So that's very important for you to understand. Um, uh, why the decreased cardiac output occurs related to whatever we're talking about. So with an MI, decreased cardiac output is, is going to occur why? Related to ischemia of the heart muscle, right? Um, uh, as evidenced by whatever, paleness, decreased mental status, decreased pulses, okay? Uh, and affect the tissue perfusion, which is very close to decreased cardiac output. You can even say decreased cardiac output related to and effective tissue perfusion, right? So they're so closely related. Um, pain, we talked about. Fear goes along with this. Impending doom, think they're going to die if you're having an If you've ever had one, hopefully you haven't. Um, and ineffective coping, so that can be related to um, medication noncompliance, denial, or anything like that. All right? We talked about these to preserve cardiac function, cardiac workload, decrease the demand for oxygen. Um, and complications of an MI, one of the major complications of an MI is heart failure. And we'll talk in depth about that. So talk about cardiac catheterization and briefly with PCR. But cardiac catheterization is the process or the procedure that we use to do PCR. So um, this cardiac catheterization is where they insert a, a um, catheter into an artery. Generally, they're going to use a femoral artery but there are some cardiologists that will use the radial artery, which comes with decreased risk if the radial artery is used. Not many physicians will do that. But basically what happens is, is that a catheter with a camera and, and devices on the end to put a stent in or balloon with are inserted into the artery. And it, um, if you, like I said, usually we're using the femoral artery, so we'll go up the aorta. So you're going backwards against blood flow because you can't get to the left ventricle, right? and lets you go into the arterial system. If you go into the venous system, where are you going to end up? In the right ventricle. You need to be in the left ventricle here. So you, the, the catheter is threaded up to the left ventricle, and then when that catheter is in the left ventricle, die is released. And the patient will be under, um, I think it's for continuous fluoroscopy. Um, and fluoroscopy is basically a live x-ray. It's a, you watch the screen, and it's like you're watching a live x-ray. So, the patient is under fluoroscopy, the dye is released, and, um, and then the, they can see the actual perfusion of the, heart, of, the, of the coronary arteries. And they can see where it's blocked, by what percentage it's blocked, and therefore what needs to be done after that. Um, balloon, which is angioplasty, may be done. So on the end of that catheter, like I said, has the ability to do a balloon. So that small catheter can go through that if there is any opening in that, in that uh, plaque, then it can be blown up and kind of push it out and out of the way. Um, stents usually are placed, because if, you, if the patient just has an angioplasty, they have a very high risk of just the, the, the plaques reforming or shrinking back down and causing 
for the problem again. So usually they will do an angioplasty with stent placement. Okay? If stents can't be used, um, the patient will go to the operating room and will have uh, open heart bypass surgery. Coronary artery bypass graft is cabbage. Okay? Um, so anytime that a patient is consented for a cardiac cath, what are they also consented for? The cabbage. They don't have time while you're laid out on the table in a sterile situation to say, well, Mr. Jones, um, you want to do a cabbage? There, it's not the time to consent then. You are consented for poor cath. Generally, the patient knows that there is a risk that I'll end up in the operating room after this cardiac cath. Right? Has anybody ever had a cath? They're probably consented for cabbage too. All right. So here are some nursing implications uh, surrounding a cardiac catheterization. So if, if it is planned, we often do plan uh, cardiac caths. Um, so they need to be MPO. Iodine is used during this procedure. That's the, the chemical that is, or the element that is picked up under fluoroscopy. Um, so if the patient is allergic to iodine, there will be some changes that need to be made. All right. Why would you assess if the patient is on aspirin or warfarin? Risk for bleeding. You're going into an artery here. High risk for bleeding if you puncture an artery. Because there's more pressure in it. <clears throat> A lot of nursing responsibility comes post cardiac cath. Right? And our responsibility here is a lot of assessment and monitoring of the patient. Uh, it depends on your facility and the procedure that is used, but just in general, the patient will have to lie flat for a certain period of time post cardiac cath because if they sit up, you know, it can impair the area where it was inserted, the catheter, and it can increase the patient's risk for bleeding by moving around that area. You're going to puncture right where your body bends when you sit up or when you bend your leg. So the patient's leg must stay flat on the bed and the patient will be laid flat. The maximum amount of time that this is going to have to happen is six to eight hours. They have, they have um, a, a way to do this now where they insert, I'll think of it as a plug. It's called something and I can never remember the name of it. But basically they insert a plug, like a cork, into that hole in the artery and it seals it off so it doesn't bleed. And eventually that cork or plug dissolves as the, as the clot forms over that opening. So that decreases the amount of time that the patient has to lie flat. All right. How are we going to know that the patient's uh, extremity distal to the site is perfusing? Pulses. Right? So just assess the pupil pulses as ordered. Usually it's every two hours or so. Okay? <clears throat> Teach the patient to report signs of hyperperfusion in that extremity. What are those signs? Cold, pale, tingling. Color changes, cold, yeah. Right. So teach them to assess or to report those things. Also teach your family. Your family is a big resource, especially if this patient comes to the ICU step down, cardiac step down after a cath and not in the ICU. You might have five patients and they've all had cath or heart caths. Um, it's, it's a lot of work to go in, lay eyes on that patient every hour. You know. So make sure you've got a good team working with you. Um, Okay. Bleeding. The patient is at risk for bleeding. Um, and it seems pretty simple. Oh, I see a patient bleeding, right? It's nice and, it would be nice and bright red blood because it's arterial, right? Mm -hmm. You won't always see it as easily. Um, sometimes the patient can bleed and they will bleed out of the body, uh, you know, but it might drain right in between the legs. You have to pull the blanket back and you see a little, little blood on the, on the dressing. You don't think you know, not unless it was saturated, maybe you get more again. Maybe just draining just inside under the patient. But you have to make sure that the patient is not bloody under them. It can hide blood. And also the patient can have what we call a retroperitoneal bleed, which is where the patient will bleed in the, the bleeding, but it's not coming out of the body, it's bleeding inside of the body. So there that's called a retroperitoneal bleed. So you have to assess the patient for any bruising or large areas of anemosis, or purple, you know, so assess for that as well. So anytime you're assessing a patient, you want to work under them, pull the sheets back, look at their side, look, you know, look at everything when you're assessing for bleeding. Because you don't want to be the nurse that has a patient that bleeds out. 
at your heart chat because they're really going to blame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and you know, and I don't want, I don't want to say CYA all the time. Do what's best for your patient, right? Somebody does that matter also? You can do the matter crisps if the patient will think they are bleeding. Okay. They probably will do, you know, an H and H or a CBC before the procedure and maybe after to see how it changed, and then maybe the next morning. But if you think that they're actually actively bleeding, they will do it very frequently. All right. Real quick about a, a cabbage, but just remember that this is open heart surgery. This is where the physician goes in and um, opens on the chest up. Okay, it's very, very, very invasive surgery. The 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 vessel that is usually uh, grafted or used to bypass the clot. That's what's called bypass. But you're bypassing an area of occlusion in the coronary artery. So usually they use the saphenous vein, and that comes from the leg. Um, the saphenous vein is, works very well for this. And remember that veins have valves in them. There's not a lot of pressure in veins, so therefore um, there's valves to help the blood come up against gravity. Um, the arteries don't have valves in them. So what they do to turn this vein into an artery is flip it around. So therefore if you're, if you're going you know, not against the valve, it's just going to continuously stay open. But if, if the pressure comes back against it, then it's going to close. So they will turn it around opposite flow, therefore it becomes an artery. Does that make sense? So just remember, because the saphenous vein is usually used, and it's in the leg, the patient will have an incision on the, probably the, the um, inside, medial side of their lower leg, maybe their upper leg, so they pull down the saphenous vein. S A P H E N O S. I wasn't an English major. Neither was he. So, with this, I'll say nursing education is key pre op. A lot of teaching for the families and a lot of teaching for the patient. So, let them know that you know this is a very invasive surgery. Your responsibility also goes for the family with these patients. Every time that a patient has a cabbage, they will be in the cardiac or the CVICU after the surgery, and they will be intubated. Um, so you have to let them know that. Now, when you come out of the surgery, you're going to have a breathing tube in. We're going to wake you up as soon as possible to get that tube out, given that you're perfusing well and not having any complications. So hopefully they can remember that post op. It may be difficult for them. But because anesthesia makes you forget a lot of stuff. But um, Families too, so they think, well, he came in just from chest pain, and then they see him, and oh my God, he's laid out in the ICU and intubated with tubes everywhere, and they will be terrified. So just let them know that this is everyone gets this after a cabbage, everyone's intubated, um, and hopefully we will get them weaned off the vent, get the next day as soon as possible. Patients after a cabbage sometimes go home a few days later now. They stay in the hospital probably for weeks. Right? We do that for a long time, and we know that nurses or patients stay in the hospital years ago for a lot, much longer time than they do now. Now we want to get them home as soon as possible as soon as get safe in the hospital. But, um, so, education about the, how it's going to happen in the surroundings around the cabbage. Um, so here are your nursing, major nursing responsibilities after a cabbage cardiac rhythm. Uh, vital signs are very important. Signs of cardiac output. Um, Maybe this might be a good time to mention this, but one extremely good indicator of cardiac output is what? Urinary output. So if your kidneys are being perfused, we're doing pretty good. Because when your body goes into compensatory mode and starts vasoconstricting and deciding which organ is priority here, the kidneys often get left out first. So it's like, we don't need your kidneys right now. We just need to get the brain and the heart perfused right now. So, um, if your kidneys are making urine, what's happening? They're being perfused. Right. So, urinary output is very important to assess here. We talked about airway, and the patient will have be intubated with the breathing tube, be on the ventilator most of the times after a cabbage. Very invasive, so prevention of infection. The patient's going to have lots of invasive lines, catheters, tubes, central lines, maybe even we'll have some very invasive monitoring that we Right. So, 
All right, so we talked about an MI and all that stuff, and we said that one of the major complications of an MI is heart failure. Y'all need a minute to just take a short break. Don't leave. Just when you stand up and just talk to your neighbor for a minute, you need to wait a little bit. Because this is important. All right? Heart failure is important. <coughs> So, heart failure can be caused by an MI. Usually, or often, this is what's happened. Um, but when you think about heart failure, you think about the, the failure of the heart to effectively pump. Okay? Um, so, it's not that your heart doesn't work anymore. It's not working real well. The heart failure means it's, it's, it's not effectively delivering blood and oxygen to the body. Okay. Um, lots of people in the United States have heart failure, and here are all those uh, risk factors. So coronary artery disease, MI, cardiomyopathies, which you will learn about, uh, chronic hypertension, a person who has, hyper has had hypertension for a very long time is at risk of developing um, um, heart failure. And if you have any diseases of the valves in the heart, specifically the mitral valve, uh, can, because that's on the left side of the heart, where that left ventricle is, the work force of the heart. You have two types of heart failure, left heart failure and right heart failure. So when you think about left-sided heart failure, that's left side of the heart, heart failure. When we think about this as congestive heart failure. So left-sided heart failure is congestive heart failure. So for some, for some reason, the heart muscle has been damaged. Um, and it is not pumping effectively, maybe because it's been ischemic, and just can't squeeze very well for some reason. Um, after a while, um, maybe it's due to the chronic hypertension, because the patient has chronic hypertension, untreated, the afterload, the pressure in the arterial system, is elevated, right? The pressure is elevated. So therefore, that left ventricle has to work really hard to overcome that afterload. So it's squeezing extra hard. Well, any time that you work a muscle out, what happens to it? It gets bigger, right? Well, one muscle that we don't want to be hypertrophy, for sure, is the cardiac muscle. We want it to be nice and lean. Um, when, so therefore, when that left ventricle works too hard, it will get bigger. So therefore, when the um, left ventricle gets bigger, what happens to the space, to the actual ventricle, excuse me, when the, when, the, when the muscle of that left ventricle gets too big, what happens to the lumen or the inside of the ventricle? It gets smaller because that muscle gets bigger and just overcomes and makes that, that opening or the ventricle itself smaller. So therefore, what can it, it, it doesn't hold as much blood. So if that left ventricle can't hold as much blood, it can't be ejected. And also after a while, once it gets so big, um, it just doesn't, it's not very effective anymore. It's not extremely lean. We call it a, a boggy heart, floppy, flappy. Um, they use those terms, okay? A big floppy heart. Um, so it's big, but it's not really squeezing really well. So therefore, you will have decreased emptying of that left ventricle, um, and it's not going to be ejected out into the aorta very well. So patient still may likely have that chronic hypertension, increased afterload, now that left ventricle is big, it will, maybe we're not getting a lot of perfusion at all. So therefore we say it's an ineffective pump, right? It's not pumping effectively. We can't get blood and perfusion and oxygen to the body like we need. 
The pressure in that left ventricle will also increase because it's not being ejected. So the pressure in that left ventricle increases. So when you think about congestive heart failure, you think about it congesting. So it's, that means backing up, right? So you just have to think backwards here. So the end of the system, we think of maybe the aorta. What precedes the aorta? Left ventricle. What precedes the left ventricle? Left atrium. But more importantly, what precedes that? The lungs. As the pressure increases in the left ventricle, it's going to increase in the left atrium. It's going to increase in the pulmonary vascular. So therefore, you will have pulmonary hypertension, maybe. All right. And you think about how, uh, just maybe just with simple um, osmosis, a semipermeable membrane, right? Um, but if you were to increase the pressure uh, inside of that semipermeable membrane, what's going to happen to the fluid? It's going to leak out of that membrane. So therefore, the membrane is the vessel wall, right? So if we have extra pressure in the pulmonary vasculature, what's going to happen likely? Fluid is going to leak extravascularly into the third spaces. And here, that third space that is important is what? The alveoli. So the alveoli will begin to fill with fluid. Pulmonary hypertension can lead to pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema is the release of fluid into the alveoli, basically. That's not good, right? Because if there's fluid in the alveoli, What's not happening? No Diffusion. There's no oxygenation, no gas exchange. Okay? Big problem. You know, that'll kill you, right? Did I say all that? <laughs> but because, you know, you think about it congesting, right? Backing up. Pressure increases, pressure increases, lungs are increased. What precedes the lungs? The right ventricle, right? So that will congest and cause right side of heart failure too, all right? Let's talk about the manifestations of left-sided or congestive heart failure. When you think about this, what mostly you think about the signs and symptoms of this as pulmonary manifestations. Why? Well, probably pulmonary edema is happening, right? Mm -hmm. Pulmonary hypertension. So you think about mostly car or respiratory signs and symptoms with left-sided or congestive heart failure. Why would you have decreased urinary output? The so heart's not effectively pumping or perfusing the body. Very good indicator of cardiac output. <clears throat> right sided heart failure is also called core pulmonale. You'll see it documented both ways. Okay, So maybe the left side has caused the right side to congest and cause right sided heart failure. You have increased the pulmonary vascular resistance. That's just a fancy word. An increased pressure in the pulmonary vasculature. Okay, increased pulmonary vascular resistance. So therefore, the right ventricle is going to have a hard time getting blood into the lungs because there's too much pressure in there. Right. So that basically, the afterload of the right ventricle is what the pressure in the pulmonary vasculature. The afterload of the left ventricle is the bottom, right? The aorta. So. Um, <coughs> Increased pressure in the right ventricle, the right atrium. Well, what precedes the right side of the heart? The body, right? Mm -hmm. The, 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 the subclavian, right? The so, and that's the body. So, um, so therefore, what would you have manifestations of here? Edema mm -hmm. of the extremities, the body. Okay. With left side of heart failure, you have pulmonary edema. With the right side of heart failure, you have, failure, you have body edema. To make it simple. <clears throat> organ edema, one of the main things that we think about that gets edema this year when we think about organs is the liver. Because the liver is, has lots of vasculature and it's connected directly to the superior, inferior vena cava, right? It's part of the portal circulation. A long time ago, right? Portal circulation. Um, so the pressure in that becomes increased. And it's the same principle. The pressure in it is an increase. That fluid is going to shift out. The patient's going to have liver edema. The patient may have Cites signs really of liver failure, right? So, what do they call it? Uh, right? <laughs> um, portal hypertension. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> um, so, therefore, you can have some organ edema, but what we're going to visualize and we're going to assess most easily is edema, usually of the extremity, of the lower extremities. So, you're going to have. Lower extremity edema, think about the lower legs, 
and it's going to be pitting into him probably. Big, fat, canker. Right? <laughs> pitting. You know what pitting means? You push it in, and you have a crater left. So that indicates there's fluid in there in that third space. So, all right, so therefore, the manifestations of right-sided heart failure are those, the organ edema and also the edema of the body. Another manifestation that is, is, is good to assess is jugular vein distension. So generally, no one in here, sh I should be able to see your jugular vein right now. Because you're sitting at 90 degrees, and it should be nice and flat. Um, and, but in a person that has increased pressure in the right side of the heart, the, the, the jugular vein will become distended. And that's because there's increased pressure in it. That, that vessel is very close to the right side of the heart, so the pressure in that vessel will also be increased. So um, just for your own practice, know how to assess jugular vein distension. Um, and generally, we assess jugular vein distension with patients between 30 and 45 degrees. Um, we assess the jugular vein. So we're not going to have them sit up nice and straight because we might get a false flat jugular vein in there. But we put them at 30 to 45 degrees. And, and also, in us, and we that don't have heart failure, we should have a nice flat jugular vein even laying lay in 30 degrees. But a person with heart failure is going to be about sticking out, right? And the person that is very uh, obese, maybe has a really big neck, you may not see it very well, but you can pal even palpate it. Okay? Remember that the, the difference between pitting and, and dependent edema. Um, very, basically, dependent can be pitting, but dependent edema usually is dependent on the patient's position. So lay on the left side, they're going to have edema on the left side. It's dependent edema, right? Okay. I think that's a good stopping point for this. We'll pick back up with heart therapy, because I want to go through some questions. With you. Hopefully you can answer them. Um, Give me just a second. So in case, you didn't, in case you didn't know this, and maybe you did, but the way that we kind of operate in nursing is with Bloom's taxonomy, um, or with nursing education, uh, nursing questions. So I wanted to make sure that you're aware of the different levels of questions. Um, and I'm doing this early so that you can practice this. The point of this is not for you to identify the type of question that you're answering. It's just simply to let you know that there are different types of questions. And I'll show you the differences. And some questions are considered high level and some questions are considered low level. You've heard that before, but you didn't know what it meant. You're like, okay, well, some are harder than others. It's probably how you determine the best. Right. No, that's okay. That's true. But um, So realize that you have lower level questions over here with the knowledge and comprehension. These are regurgitation type of questions. These are questions that you had in AD. This is simply, you read it, you memorized it, and you can tell me that you did so. Well, I don't really care. Um, um, so 
that's you have to be able to memorize things, some things in order to apply it. But you, this is this is a high level course, so therefore I'm not going to ask you very many knowledge based or comprehension type of questions. And these these verbs are questions that you might identify in a question that will be knowledge or comprehension based. Um, so therefore, identify something, you know, uh, repeat or state. Um, and then the, the verbs get a little more complicated or advanced with comprehension, but they're very similar. Um, locate, infer, identify. So these are low-level knowledge and comprehension-based questions. Okay? You had a lot of these in foundations, um, and they were still hard in foundations because the style of the question was different, but it still is a knowledge-based or comprehension type of question. Medium level, moderate difficulty questions are application and analysis questions. In the, in the probably in the second and third semester, this was the this was the majority of your question. What is the nurse's priority action? What should the nurse do next? What is the priority assessment? The nurse should then things like that. So you're asked to apply things and to know how to analyze or um, not evaluate, but but interpret what you are given and then know what to do about it. In, in the large portion of any nursing exam past the first semester is going to be application and analysis based, even with us, okay? But that doesn't mean that there's so much, a lot of the tests that it's going to be high level. So in the past you had some high level questions which is synthesis, some people call synthesis creating, but and some people will say that synthesis is above evaluation, whatever, it doesn't matter. High-level questions are synthesis and evaluation questions, and these you've had some of these before, but you had a very low percentage of them on your test in the third semester, probably mostly in the teens. Um, but um, so there, we do have a breakdown of the percentage of types of questions we're supposed to put on the test, and we do our best to match with that. But in this class, um, you will have um, a, a very large portion. Um, the largest portion will be application. And but the rest of it is probably going to be synthesis and evaluation. So if you can only do application and analysis type questions, you have half the test. So uh, very few knowledge and comprehension type of questions in this course. What application or what evaluation and synthesis questions are? Synthesis question, I like creating maybe better because you're given lots of data and you're are made to figure something out, synthesize it, create it, put it together, and then decide what an assessment is. Or then decide what an assessment or what um, an outcome should be. Planning is a lot is a big thing with synthesis. So if you ever ask a question that says, "What is a nursing outcome? What is the best plan for this patient?" That's a high level question. that's creating a synthesis. Okay. Evaluation is a question that that tells you or that tells us that you know how to evaluate treatment. So one of the major responsibilities of an RN is to evaluate the treatment that is given, nursing care and medical. We have to evaluate that it is effective. So anytime that you see a question that says, um, the nurse knows, or you think knows, that must be a knowledge question. No. The nurse knows that this medication or treatment has been effective when the client does what? So you, number one, have to, you have to know a few things to answer that. What, what, what is the medication if it's a medication question? Um, and how the medication works and how it will manifest in the patient. That's a few steps that you have to go through in order to answer this question. It's not just straightforward, you know, what are the four chambers of the heart? It's a knowledge-based question, which I will not ask. Um, <laughs> so you're asked here to, to predict things, to, to judge things, to evaluate things. And that's a big responsibility in nursing. Okay? Just because you feel like that it's not really evaluation or synthesis, realize that other high-level questions that might disguise themselves or what they'll do. Apply for high level questions. Um, other questions that are high level that might disguise themselves are uh, delegation questions. Okay, prioritization. Which patient do I see first? Who can do this? Who can do that? Who do I tell or ask to do this? Okay, so there you go. You'll see this on Tagger. You don't have to print out later. All right, so just be aware of that. And like I said, it's not the purpose of you to study and go through, okay, what type of question is this? But you should maybe kind of be able to identify it because if you're studying and you're getting a lot of these questions by saying, man, I'm doing good, 
Well, you're really not, okay? Because you're not you're you're making a hundred percent, but you're making a hundred percent on foundations level questions. Um, you need to answer questions that have these verbs in them, okay? These verbs. Stay away from those. So you need to identify. So don't spend a lot of time on this, but but eventually say, well, this looks pretty knowledge based. So just don't look at it again, okay? That's what I want you to take from this. <clears throat> so let's practice it. So, I, I, when I do practice questions, I don't like people to shout it out because chances are somebody still thinking about it. So just read this first, just read the first question. <clears throat> We know that this is knowledge based because it's simply asking for a definition. The nurse knows that this is that. Okay. Mm -hmm. so this is a definition. It's still not an easy question, is it? Mm -hmm. You probably narrowed it down to two. Um, Brian, which give me one that you that you immediately said that's not the answer. C. C? Right. Okay. Because what is C? That's a solid blood pressure, right? It's not cardiac output. Um, does anybody else have one that they that they have that they have excluded? A. a. Okay. Uh, the amounts of blood returned to the heart during diastole. Well, we're talking about output, not return. Okay, so those are key words there to, to throw that one out. Um, and that's that's more reflective of what preload, right? And diastolic volume. So you guys have got it down to what now? B and D, they sound very similar, don't they? So you have to decide which one's better. So therefore, if you know the definition of ejection fraction, you would have to, you would know that this answer is what D, right? Because ejection fraction is measured in percentage. So having said that, you need to know what the definition of eje what ejection fraction is. Ejection fraction, I'll talk about it. We measure it usually with a Electric or with a uh, echocardiogram, and um, and we use it to monitor heart failure. We'll talk about it a little bit tomorrow, Thursday. So cardiac output is the amount of blood ejected from the heart each minute. How is cardiac output measured? Liters per minute, right? What's a normal cardiac output? Four to six, four to eight. All right. <clears throat> The difference right there was percentage and amount. That's still a low-level question. <clears throat> Scary, right? Uh -huh. But that's okay. Sure. You, would have, you would have done much better on this on the test because you would have studied it. The next question is very similar to knowledge base, but it's more comprehension. Comprehension means to understand. Knowledge means to remember. All right. So read the second question slowly, and don't shout anything out. This question might be tricky initially because it's wordy. There's a lot of words to read here. Um, anytime that you have a question that has um, a two-part answer, don't get tripped up because both parts have to be right for that answer to be right. Right? You don't get partial credit. Right? So um, you have to find. Basically, you have to know the definition of heart failure and am I and understand it because what I've done here is I've reworded it so you have to understand that patho in, in order to to, read, to answer this because you have to be able to read that, that 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 definition of it in any type of way that somebody says it so if Halen described heart failure Wendy should be able to understand what she's talking about you know whatever all right so to understand it means that somebody can describe it in their own words and you still get it or you can describe it in your own 
words. So here we go. Um, MI is fa failure of the heart to effectively pump. Is that true? No. You don't even have to read the second half of it, right? A is wrong, right? B, MI is narrowed arteries of the heart. Is that true? No. 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 What is that? Uh, yeah, that's coronary artery disease, right? Narrowed arteries of the heart. So don't even read the second half because the first half is wrong. So, obviously, then we've got it down to C and D. MI is death of heart tissue. Is that true? Yes. yes. Um, and D also says MI is death of heart tissue. Okay, so therefore, we know that the second half of this part of this question is to determine which one is right. So, forget the first part. So, which of these is right? D. 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 Is heart failure increased afterload? No, it can lead to it. But that is not heart failure. Heart failure is the ineffective pump. Okay? Do you, you get that? You just told us. Huh? You just told us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's still not an easy question, right? Because there's a lot of words here. And so I'm showing you how to answer a question like this. Yeah, I know. It's, it's really easy to answer when you, when you just had it. <laughs> Let's look at this application type of question. All right, read that. It's a short question. It's just asking me, what do you do? What are you supposed to do? That's a very important in nursing is to know, know what you're supposed to do. So the client is found down, meaning that they were laid out on the ground, right? And they are not awake and alert. What should the nurse do next? Basically is what this ask, is asking. The priority action. The most important thing to do first for this patient is what? So what, what, uh, what are, or is one, Brooke, that you ruled out? Uh, Brooke, which one did you rule out? B. B. She ruled out B. Why did you rule out B? You're leaving, you're leaving the patient. You don't leave them. Okay. You might yell real loud. But you don't go to your car to get your phone and then come back to the patient while they're laid out there. All right? <laughs> so, um, Kristen says she eliminated A. Why, why would you not elevate the head? Of the, the head? Oh, it's not going to make a hill of beans, right? My grandmother always says, right? doesn't matter, a hill of beans. All right? So, you're down to C and D. They both look pretty good, right? They both look maybe, maybe good, right? No? I'm just hoping to trick you more. Um, so they're both assessments, right? All right? So which one is the better assessment? C. C, to check the carotid pulse. We want to make, we want to see if this patient has a pulse. It's most important. Okay. <laughs> You might think here, well, we also need to see if they're breathing, right? Yeah. Well, that's not an option, all right? Of these four, which is the priority, all right? You don't think, well, what if? Well, we should do this, but it's not there. Who cares? That's not an option, so get it out of your mind. Never say what if or imply anything to the question. Only take what is at face value in your question, all right? The next one is an analysis type of question. This is maybe going to trip you up. Answer or read this very slowly. Oh, shoot. So in this question, you need to decide what are the most important things here. Uh, Angela, what do you think is a key important thing here to know in this question? They're on anticoagulants. That's important. Okay, the patient's on anticoagulant. Um, that's really the most important thing. 
Also, it's important to realize that this patient has an irregularly irregular rhythm, which is probably AFib, right? Because it was if it were VFib, you know, this certainly would not be my priority, right? Um, <laughs> chest compressions would be my priority. So, um, so we've given this patient a nursing diagnosis of risk for injury related to the administration of anticoagulants. What is the risk for injury mostly related to that? Bleeding. Bleeding. Okay. So, um, what is the most appropriate outcome? I like questions like this. Um, so, which one, um, if anybody, have you ruled out? Give me one that has ruled out. Sherika, did you rule one out? C. C. Why? Well, I know with the irregularly irregular rhythm, if they're going to have anticoagulants, it's a I and R listed, but I didn't see anything about the A P T T. Okay. That's an okay rationale, but this patient may be on heparin which will affect the APTT, right? But somebody give me a better reason to rule out C. Nope, not, not a good reason. Yeah. This is a medical assessment. This is a doctor's goal. This is not a nurse's goal. So therefore, if that's a doctor's goal, what else appears a doctor's goal? All right. We certainly assess it. But we don't directly do anything to change that. The physician does. Okay? We assess it. All right? So, therefore, how do we know? So, therefore, if you have an outcome, what is the outcome? It should be directly opposite of your diagnosis. So, which of these tells us that our patient has not received injury? B and D look a lot alike, right? Which one is better? D. 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 Because B is what? Not measurable. Um, They're very, simple, very similar. I will be honest, this was on an exam last semester. Okay. You have to, when, you, when you're down to, if you've rolled it down to two and they seem very similar, you have to say which one is better. And we're for an outcome, what's the number one rule of an outcome? It must be measurable. It's no signs of bleeding. It's not specific and it's not measurable. But you can directly assess bruising and petechia. You can measure that. Okay? Those are signs of bleeding. Right? Bruising and petechia are signs of bleeding that are measurable. You don't like it? It items out very well. It's a very good question. Statistics. A or C could be correct. Really, for really A, C, and D are correct for a physician. But for us, we don't do anything directly to change the eye. We give the medicine, but we don't order it. So I still don't understand. I mean, bruising and petechiae are signs of bleeding. I right. don't understand. I would pick B. You don't want okay. them to have bruising. So, so therefore, if if um, let me think. If your clinical instructor said, um, this patient's on warfarin, um, what is your outcome because you don't want them to bleed? You're going to say, what? I want them to bleed, right? Well, that instructor's going to say, well, tell me how you know they're not bleeding. They don't have bruising, they don't have fatigue yet. That's a better goal. Got it? Does that make more sense? It, you can't specifically, it's, yeah, it's, it is, it is tricky. But, but what about internal bleeding that I don't have to see? I mean, they might have a radial bleeding. You, like, you can still assess that sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. With bruising. Bruising is internal bleeding. Right. But anyway, all right, so that's, so that's that. Look at, look at the synthesis question. Synthesis means we're putting lots of knowledge together to get an outcome. There's a, there's a good bit happening here, right? There's a, you have to have a lot of knowledge to answer these questions. Do you see that? So let's decide what's going on here. The patient's had an MI, all right? 
um, we've drawn a, cardiac, drawn a cardiac panel, and here are the results. So if we, if we want to know anything about a, an MI, we don't even look at CPK, right? Yeah. Not specifically, right? Well, we'll monitor it, but it doesn't give us diagnosis. So you can just cross out CPK. Okay. So we're looking at the CKMV and troponin. So you, number one, will have to know what is a normal CKMV and what is a normal troponin. All right. So, and you will learn that. It's in your book. A normal CKMV is three or less. Right. And I'm not sure what your book says. There's lots of different labs, but a normal troponin is usually anything less than 0.4. I mean, so therefore, we know this troponin is high. The CKMB is normal. So, if the cardiac panel is drawn at 8 o'clock, and here are results, the CKMB is normal, so it has not yet risen. It has not been detected yet. So if only the troponin has been detected, how long ago did this start? Two to four hours ago. Okay? So, therefore... At what time did the MI probably begin? Six, Six o'clock. It wouldn't be three because three is five hours before eight. Yes, ma'am. Does it matter if the defendant is, say, point eight, we still go by that? Yeah, if the CKMB is not elevated, we know that it hasn't yet been four hours. Okay. Yep. I think your book might actually say six to eight. I'm not exactly sure. Okay. It depends on the lab and things. <clears throat> so it's not three o'clock because that's five hours. Troponin is two to four. Therefore, it wouldn't be one or one thirty, right? Because that's even further. Before. What did you say normal troponin is? Usually, it's less than zero point four. So that's certainly you know what ten times what we would like it to be. So we know that that's high. I'm not going to give you like on the border of normal. If you see it, you should, hopefully I want you to say, oh, that's high. You know, and that's really what you need to know. It's too high. All right? <clears throat> this was on an exam. Okay. You would have got your own? Because I think the questions like this overwhelm people when you first see them. So you have to think about it real quick, pull out stuff that you don't know, and really figure out what it's asking. Okay, you said the normal troponin is usually less than 0.4. Right. Okay, our book says 3.1. Yeah. yeah, it depends on the lab. It depends on the lab. But just remember what your book says. It's 3.1. That still is higher than what your book says. So, but see, yeah, it depends on the lab and how it's made. There's different types of troponin also. There's different types, but you just need to know troponin. All right. Look at this one. Evaluation, remember, is evaluating something, right? So read this question to yourself. was effective. I typed this quickly. Is it effect? This isn't an extremely lengthy question. Right? You have to know a few things to answer it. Um, the number one thing that you need to know about this question is what? What is amiodarone? What does it do and how does it work and what it's used for? Right? So, um, and we're giving it to a patient with some sort of, sort of irregular or a wrong rhythm, an abnormal rhythm. So, in, in, and I'll also talk about this real quick. I know it's time to go. But you have to remember that your, your question has... Um, um, background information in your question has a stem. Your stem is what's actually being asked. So the stem here is the nurse knows that the medication was effective when what? The background information is the nurse gave amiodarone to a patient with a cardiac dysrhythmia. That's your background information. The stem usually directly or precedes the options and it's the actual question of the, of the question. All this the first sentence is helping you answer the stem. Okay. The nurse knows that the medication was effective when. So which of these, uh, Shelby, did you rule out? 
Heart rate decreased. And you ruled out blood pressure. Okay. The, the best one that you ruled out was A. Blood pressure decreased. That would that probably we would hope that maybe then blood pressure would increase, right? Um, but heart rate decreased could be could be okay, right? Could be, but but you rule it out, which is good. So you rule it out A and B. So we have it down between C and D. And um, who answered C? And who answered D? A few people answered D. Okay. Um, so the answer is C, because amiodarone is an antidysrhythmic, right? Um, and we use it usually when the patient has an irregular rhythm or something like that. So this is the best measurement it, of, of this medication. We're assessing the change in the dysrhythmia, right? Um, D, maybe the patient might be more alert. Maybe they got a little more cardiac output. But this is the best measurement because this is an anti-dysrhythmic. And we're assessing the rhythm here. Okay? Those match the best. You okay? No. Well, um, so you've been forewarned, okay? Um, I wrote this question just about five minutes before class, so it could have been harder. But um, so there's an idea of the type of questions that you will have. All right? Email me with questions. Let me know if you need to give me anything with your TCPS.